Well, friends, can we turn again now to God's word and to that passage that we read, the book of Exodus, and we're going to read just now at verse um, 1, chapter 28, uh, sorry, Exodus chapter 28, and we're going to read at verse 1, and take unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons, and so on. <clears throat> now we have come to an end of our studies in the tabernacle. I think there were 12, if my memory is right. And you remember, we worked our way gradually from the outer court of the tabernacle in through the various parts. And over the last number of weeks, we reached eventually the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, and then the Ark of the Covenant, which was there. But uh, I, I felt last week um, afterwards that uh, I hadn't really finished the whole thing off as neatly as I would like. And I want to round things up a bit better tonight, I trust, by focusing on the priests who would serve in the tabernacle. Now, this is a study in itself, and I have no intention of launching into that, but <clears throat> it is a crucial part of the whole tabernacle, because without priests, there would be no activity, and without the activity, the tabernacle would very rapidly become a, a museum piece. But God instructed them to build the tabernacle, and it was a place of constant activity. Now, as soon as we mention the Old Testament priests, it, it sends us to two other places, doesn't it? It sends us, first of all, as you know very well, to the Lord Jesus Christ, who was prefigured and symbolized by all of these priests. He is the great high priest, the only priest of the New Testament church. Nobody else takes that title but himself. But it also sends us to the Lord's people. And although nobody else has the priesthood that he has, they, in their own lives, have their own priesthood. We are introduced in the New Testament to what we call the priesthood of all believers. 1 Peter uh, speaks of that, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 and 9. See it for yourselves, where he speaks of the people of God being a royal priesthood, offering up spiritual sacrifices to God. Every true Christian believer is a member of the New Testament priesthood. Now, as we come to the priesthood tonight, there are a number of things I want to focus on. And it's all to do with their first taking up office. What happened when they first took off, up office? Well, first of all, and I'll spend most of my time probably on this one. First of all, they were appointed. They were appointed, or to be precise, they were chosen, or as it says in verse 1, they were taken. They were taken. Now, I want us to notice three things about this appointment. First of all, it was a divine choice. This may seem very obvious, but I want to underline it. It was a divine choice. It was not by popular election. The children of Israel didn't have a hundred candidates and they chose some priests out of them or a thousand candidates. It was not by popular election. It was not by self-nomination where somebody said, well, I think I'd be quite suitable for this and then they present themselves to Moses. In fact, it wasn't even left up to Moses. The choice was not 
left in man's hands at all. It's God's sovereign choice that we see at work here. The mystery of that is beyond us. The purposes of that are often beyond us as well. But the Lord chose the tribe of Levi and appointed them to this task and to this work. And when we apply our minds to the priesthood of Christ, which it all symbolized, we meet the same, the exact same point. It too is a divine appointment. He is the eternal son of God. And yet, nevertheless, he is appointed. Chapter 5 of Hebrews and verse 10. Um, verse 4, first of all, in fact. No man takes this honor to himself. But he that is called of God, as was Aaron. That's just what I've been saying. So also Christ glorified himself, glorified not himself, I should say, to be made a high priest. Verse 10, called of God, a high priest. Now this isn't diminishing his equality with the Father. Not at all. But it's emphasizing his servant role. It's emphasizing the fact that he was performing a role at the behest of the Father. And there are mysteries there that, that we cannot begin really to work out. They are beyond us. But they are revealed to us at the same time in order that the glory of God's redeeming work may become all the brighter and all the more wonderful. Because not only do we find the three persons of the Godhead operating and cooperating together, but we find God in his perfect wisdom ordaining that the son should have a servant role and yet retain at the same time his position as son, not relinquishing anything of that, not relinquishing anything of his divinity. And yet at the same time, he could speak of the Father was the one appointing him and sending him. It's all a mystery. And it's all a glorious mystery. And it's all a glorious mystery for the people of God. All of these things put in place for their good and God's glory. We should marvel at the plan of redemption. It should be a constant cause of wonder to us. We, even the persons of the God, operated and cooperated in bidding many sons unto glory. It's highlighting the fact that he is there as the high priest of his church. And then when we apply our minds to the believer and the priesthood of all believers, what do we find? We find exactly the same principle again. Again, it is a divine sovereign choice. You have not chosen me, says Christ, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. John 15, 16. It is by the grace of God, Christian, that you are by that you are what you are. Unless you have any thoughts of uh, your own goodness or any thoughts of your own merit, our friend, come back to this the electing sovereign grace of God who from all eternity has chosen a people for himself, sovereignly calls them out by his grace. They were appointed and it was a divine choice and it's always a divine choice. To him be the glory, to him be the honor. It's his planning, it's his putting in place that it all redounds to. It was a divine choice, but notice this as well. It was for divine service. It was for divine service. You see what it says in verse 1. Take Aaron and his sons that he may minister to me in the priest's office. Not to you. Not to the people in the camp. But to me. Oh, to be sure, Aaron and his sons would minister to the people. Of course he would. But his first duty, his first place, was to minister to the Lord. 
That was the primary purpose, ministering to the Lord and pleasing the Lord, not pleasing them or pleasing himself, but pleasing the one to whom he was to minister and serve. And Aaron didn't always remember that. And Aaron's descendants didn't always remember that. And they forgot at times. And they thought, well, they were there to serve the people. Well, that was very much a subordinate a, a serving. Their principal service was to the Lord. And again, uh, if we turn to Christ... What do we find? We find exactly the same thing. His duty was to do the will of the one who sent him. And he is committed to that. Constantly. And so it is for his church. You are saved to serve. Now, in the process of your life and your Christian life, you will have opportunity to serve others. Of course you will. But your primary duty, your primary service as a New Testament priest is to himself. Uh, just incidentally, this came into my mind earlier in connection with all of this. It's become popular for churches to, to have slogans. Now, I'm not keen on slogans anyway. But it's become popular for churches to have slogans. And often and often and often you'll see a, a slogan that goes something like this. The church of whatever, serving the community of whatever it might be. Now, I don't want to be hypercritical. And there is an element of truth in that. But I don't like it. I don't like it. It's the wrong emphasis. The church's primary role is not to serve the community, but to serve the Lord. The church isn't here to serve communities and to provide for them and to give them facilities. In the process of serving the Lord, they may well provide for them and they may well bring facilities that way. We mustn't put the cart before the horse, or we will lose all sight of why we're here in the first place. The church's primary role is to serve the Lord. And incidentally, I, I noticed that one of our own congregations um, had, had this emphasis very, very well put, serving the King of Kings. Amen. We are to serve the Lord. Now that may not sound as user friendly as serving the community of X, Y, and Z. But it is far more accurate. And actually, it is far more honest. It doesn't neglect or hide our first calling. It was a divine choice. It was for divine service. And thirdly, it was by divine grace. It was by divine grace. Aaron and his sons had not earned this honor. They certainly didn't deserve it. If they were to be marked according to their just deserts, they would fall. Of course they would. And there were times when they deserved to lose it after they got it. Indeed, in the case of two of the four sons, that's exactly what happened. But there was many another day when they didn't lose it. <coughs> when they should have, if divine justice was strictly applied. Grace ran through it all. The grace of God, the long-suffering of God, the patience of God. There is only one who has served perfectly. There is only one who has earned his position. There is only one who on his own merit serves and whose service is complete and perfect. And that is your representative friend. And good for you that is his soul. 
if his service was as deficient as Aaron's was, where would you be? Or if his service is as deficient as yours is, where would you be? But it's not. But just as surely as it was by divine grace, if you're included in the priesthood of the New Testament, it's still an act of grace. It is all of grace. It is by the grace of God I am what I am, says the apostle. They were appointed, and it was a divine choice. It was for divine service, and it was by divine grace. And your notice is also, it specifies in verse 1 that they were to be taken from among the people, from amongst the children of Israel. Now, that was an important principle. They were representing the people before God. And it was important that the representative came from the people. They had to be like them. They had to be one of them. And again, we find that reaching its glorious fulfillment in Christ, the, the great high priest of his church. He doesn't assume an angelic nature, but our nature. Made in all points like unto his brethren. Sharing in that humanity. Taking to himself a true body and a reasonable soul. <clears throat> so that he is like them. He is one with them. He has made himself one. Now there's another mystery. That he who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, Philippians 2, makes himself of no reputation takes upon him the form of his self, is identified with them and is identified with you because you are his. Such was his love for his people. Such was his concern for them. They were appointed. Secondly, they were dressed, chapter 28 and verse 4. And these are the garments which they shall make. And it goes through a number. Now, I don't know if anybody remembers, but we spent seven or eight weeks looking at the clothes and the uniform of the high priest back in 2011. Over a series of Wednesday evenings. I'm not going to go over it tonight. But I just want to notice that this was a part of pleasing the Lord. They couldn't dress as they pleased because every part of the robes that they wore was of significance. Each part of it was rich in symbolism. Each part of it was a part of the typology of the Lord Jesus Christ. As they go to go into the tabernacle, it's important the priests are clothed in a certain way and the high priest is clothed in a certain way. Now we're told in verse 2 that these garments were for glory and beauty. It, it, the idea there is dignity and honor. The service of God called for dignity. We're reminded of that a minute ago in prayer. How true it is. The high priest and the whole priesthood were to be dignified. And Christ was dignified. He distinguished his office. And the Christian too has to be dignified. <clears throat> worship has to be dignified and orderly. Worship is worship. It should be distinct and orderly. There should be a certain gravity in connection with worship. There should be a certain order in connection with worship. It is the worship of Almighty God. And there are some things that are inappropriate, that are perfectly appropriate in another setting, that are simply not appropriate in worship. But I'm, I'm, I'm in danger of wandering from my point. Now, the clothes were also a sort of uniform. 
You knew who the priests were, and you would know who the high priests were. As they went about their business, you would see them, and you would know who they were, and you knew who they served. And the application there, again, is straightforward. As you serve as the priesthood of God, the New Testament priesthood, people should know who you are and who you seek to serve. Not because you, you have outward garments like they had, but because you're clothed, clothed with humility, clothed with grace, clothed with gentleness, clothed with Christ-likeness. Putting off the old man, putting on the new, so that people will see you. And they'll say, ah, oh, that's the clothes, that's the dress of the appearance of the Christian. Indeed, these clothes represented certain spiritual truths. As they saw them and as they, they took notice of parts of them. And the same is true in our own lives. They were appointed. They were clothed. Thirdly, they were consecrated. Now, again, there's a great deal in this consecration that I'm not going to go into just now. But... Um, if you look, for instance, at chapter 29, um, the Lord instructed Moses to hold a public service of appointment and consecration. And during this service, Aaron and his sons were set apart and dedicated to the service of God. Chapter 29 and verse 15, he's told to take a ram and he then put their hands on the head of the ram and he would slay the ram and then uh, so on. It's, it's burnt and so on. Now, again, I, I'm not going to go into this, um, these details tonight. But just to take this much from it, they were set aside. They were to be consecrated, dedicated. That's the emphasis in all of this. This was how their lives were going to be. Their lives were going to be different from this day forward. Aaron's life was going to be different. And the way he lived his life and the priorities that guided his life, they were going to be different. And the same for his sons and his sons' sons. They are dedicated. They are consecrated. They are set aside solemnly. And then we turn to Christ, our great high priest, and we find his dedication. His consecration, total, from beginning to end. He was always about his father's business. Never distracted, unlike us. Never tired of it or turned from it. And that is the pattern. Romans 12, 1, you know the verse. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It's the same principle, dedication, consecration, focus. This wasn't a part-time calling that Aaron was taking up. Something he would do one day a week. It was full-time. When you became a New Testament priest, it's full time. Same principle. They were appointed. They were clothed. They were consecrated. Fourthly, they were washed. 29 verse 4. Aaron and his sons I shall bring to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and shall wash them with water. Now, sin is often illustrated, isn't it, by, by dirt and um, defilement. And when Aaron and his sons were washed, it was obviously a symbol that the priesthood had to be holy. They had to be clean. And when we come to Christ, we find that fulfilled perfectly. And when we come to the, the priesthood of believers, the same principle, be ye holy, for I am holy. They are called to holiness of life. Yes, dedication, but a holy dedication. And a dedication that is holy. Now you notice, they were washed all over. 
on this occasion, verse four. That only happened once. After that, well, you say they would still need to wash. Yes, they had the labor in the courtyard. They would wash their hands and their feet in the labor. This great washing took place once. The application of that is obvious, and Christ picks up on it in, in, in John 30, where he speaks to, to Peter and, and, and distinguishes between that once for all washing of regeneration and the ongoing washing of continual repentance. The person who is washed needs not to be washed again, he says. In that sense, Peter says, oh, wash me from head to foot. And the Lord says, no, 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 Peter. That doesn't happen every day. The New Testament priesthood is washed once, washed in regeneration, made clean and established for service. But the parallels are quite striking. They were appointed, they were clothed, they were consecrated, they were washed. Fifthly, they were anointed. And there was a twofold anointing. First of all, they were anointed with blood in chapter 29, verses 19 to 21. There was blood in the ear. The blood went from the ear to the toe. Everything was under the blood, from head to toe. From start to finish, from top to bottom, blood. They needed blood. And their service from head to toe needed blood. And start to finish needed blood. So it is with you as well. Under the blood. Anointed with blood. Precious blood of God. By which you have access. You see, without this anointing, there was no access into the priesthood. Aaron couldn't say, well, I don't think we'll bother with the blood. Oh, Aaron, you need the blood. Unless the blood is there, your priesthood will not be as it should be. And it's still the same. There was an anointing with blood, but there was also an anointing with oil. Chapter 29 and verse 7. He was to take the anointing oil and pour it on Aaron's head. Now, suffice to say just now that the oil in Scripture is often a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Coming down and running down. Giving wisdom and power to, to fulfill their duties. The Holy Spirit would come, would come down upon them would flow down, and by the Spirit they would serve. Christ, when we turn to him, what do we find? We find that he is anointed above measure, so that he is the mighty counselor. Into his lips, as we sang in Psalm 45, is poured a store of grace. Listen to his words all the way to the cross. Grace, grace through them all. Down to the very last words on the cross itself. What an anointing he had. And the Christian too needs anointing. The anointing of the spirit. You need the anointing of blood. And you need the, the, the oil of the Holy Spirit. To give you power and authority and wisdom. That you'll know when to speak and when not to speak. How to act and when to act. That you will be taught of the Lord. They were appointed. They were clothed. They were consecrated. They were washed. They were anointed. Sixthly and finally, they were fed. You'll find this in chapter 29, verses 22 to 28. Um, uh, just read just now, maybe um, verse 23. One loaf of bread, one cake of oil, one wafer out of the basket, and thou shalt put all in the hands of Aaron and in the hands of his son, including the, the sacrifice of the previous verse that I didn't read as well. They were fed. The portions from some of the offerings were to feed the priests. 
And if the priests were faithful and they encouraged the people to faithfully bring their offerings, they would never lack. They were fed. They had no inheritance in the land, had no patch of ground with the other tribes. But here's how they're fed. They're dependent on the Lord. Christ says that his food and drink was to do the will of his Father. And the Christian will lack no good thing. He will put it in your hands. You're saying, how will I survive tomorrow, the day after tomorrow? Oh, the New Testament priesthood, he will put it in your hands. The lion's young may lack their food. They may hungry be and they may lack their food. But they that truly seek the Lord shall not lack any good. How does the psalmist put it in 34? Earlier in 34. There's a verse there I'm trying to get to just now. No, never mind. It must be somewhere else. But uh, he's... My tongue. But anyway, it's, uh, it's where the psalmist is being told not to fret himself because for others and for those who are wicked, but uh, to, uh, yes, verse it's 37. For evildoers fret thou not thyself unquietly, nor do thou envy bear to those that work iniquity. Verse 3, set thou thy trust upon the Lord, and be thou doing good, and so thou in the land shalt dwell, and verily. Have food. Delight thyself in God. He'll give thine heart's desire to thee. Thy way to God commit him trust. It bring to pass. Shall be. Rest in the Lord and patiently wait for him. Do not fret. So that's the promise to the, the, the priesthood. There's Aaron and his sons, and it's put in their hands. You serve me. And your hands won't be empty. And the same principle applies still. You sell me, and your hand will not be empty. Well, the time is gone and I must leave it. But I'm going to leave the whole tabernacle there. And, uh, I'll leave the model out in the hall and you can look at it your leisure, but the whole thing is, um, it's richly instructive and it's full of teaching from the courtyard to the ark to the priests themselves, full of instruction, and full of Christ as well, which is the important point. It's, it's not just giving us head knowledge. But it's sending us week after week to Christ Himself. Can we unite together and we trust the Lord to follow with this blessing, that reading of His Word? Can we sing together, uh, of meditation of His Word, rather? Singing together in Psalm 16. Psalm 16 and at verse 8. 16 and at 8. Before me still the Lord I set, sith it is so that he will ever stand at my right hand, I shall not move it be. And so on, down to the end. Before me still the Lord I set. Before me still the
thy name for thy word, the Old Testament scriptures which speaks to us of Christ. We are thankful for these types and symbols. No doubt they were thankful that they had them. But we have clearer things in these New Testament days. And the symbols and types and clothes and Buildings have passed away. Therefore, uh, the types have given way to the anti-type and the symbols to the fulfillment. We grant, O oh Lord, that we may learn much from these Old Testament passages, and that we will understand our New Testament in the light of the Old and the Old in the light of the New. Go before us and hear our prayers. We echo all that was asked and petitioned already this evening by the brethren. Hear our prayers and cleanse us from sin. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion and fellowship of God, the Holy Spirit, rest on and abide with you all, now and forevermore. Amen.